Hello and welcome once again to Cambridge. Uh, this is my orchid greenhouse. It's a summery morning outside and in here it's a pleasant 24 degrees. Yesterday morning when I came in, the first thing I noticed, to my delight, and this happens um, a few times a year, is that I could smell that one of my stanhopias had popped its blooms open. And that was this one. This is Stanhopia martiana. Um, it has a fantastic perfume. As soon as you come in, you can smell that um, it's opened its blooms. They are not, I would say, the most attractive of flowers. I mean, that goes for all Stanhopias. Um, they're quite sort of, um, in a way, I would say they're actually a bit ugly. However, they do have a fantastic scent. The disadvantage is that the flowers don't last very long, but once you've got a reasonable sized plant, and as you can see here, there's another flower spike developing. This one um, was quite unusual in that it came along sideways and managed to, in fact, I just had to help it pop over the rim of the pot that it's growing in. Normally, they will grow sort of diagonally out, occasionally right down which is why you have to grow them in a net sort of basket like this. In this country, it's a bit of a problem because these American-made plastic, fantastically well-designed orchid baskets are no longer freely available. I've got a few in stock, but when they run out, um, I'll have to go over to growing in wooden slatting, but wooden slatted baskets, which I can make myself in the workshop. The reason I say run out is because after two or three years, if you haven't repotted them, the new growths tend to start coming out of the side. And in order to get at the plants to divide it, you have to cut away the basket and destroy it in the process, which is a bit of a disadvantage. So what I'm trying to do um, in this country is to preserve my stock of baskets by repotting them at an earlier stage before I have to rip away the basket to get at the plant. There are about 50 species naturally occurring of Stanhopias and many, many hybrids that have been man-made. I just grow two species because they're quite big plants and I haven't got room for more than that. And when you consider that the flowers last for three, four, maybe five days, if it's a bit cooler, you don't get a display of flowers for very long, but it is worth having at least one or two Stanhopias in a collection if you can possibly find room for them because of the remarkable scent. They really are one of the sort of delights of summer in the greenhouse here with my other orchids. Now I'll just put it back and you'll see that it actually lives, and this is where it lives all the year. It lives over here, hanging up. Where it's fairly sort of shady, uh, it gets dunked in water once a week, and at this time of the year, sprayed every morning along with my other plants. I've got another species, Stanhopia genitiana, but that isn't coming into bloom yet. I hope that it will, but I did divide all the, sta the Stanhopias last year. And so in the past, I've found that the best performance, flowering performance, is probably from the second year after dividing, when they've sort of begun to get a bit sort of crowded in their pot. Which, are, coming back to the issue about destroying pots, that is a bit of a problem. Right, the other orchids that I've got at the moment that scent the greenhouse in the evening are two Brassavolas. Now the first one is this, um, Brassavola bahiensis. At least that is the name that it came to me as. If you look it up, Brassavola bahiensis is a synonym of Brassavola sebeleta. I do have Brassavola sebeleta, but that doesn't smell 
But this has a fantastic chocolatey, vanillary, really powerful scent. There must be some sort of moth in South America that really likes chocolate. <laughs> um, or at least sort of chocolatey, vanillary sweets. Um, the flowers are beautifully elegant. I grow it on this piece of cork bark, which I think is probably the best way of growing brassavolas, because the new leaves as they come out tend to arch over and then with their weight they hang down. Now I'll show you my other one in a minute which is growing in a basket which I don't think is quite such a suitable way of growing them. So this one is one of my real treasures because it has this fantastic um, chocolatey vanilla scent and I've actually got it up. Um, it normally lives hanging high up where it gets plenty of light because these very thin leaves um, need plenty of light. I've taken it down and have it hanging up just inside the door where I can come in the evening and smell it. And I have several um, brassavolas which flower at different times of the year. This is another one which flowers at this time of the year regularly for me. This is Brassavola perinii. Very similar flowers, um, similar habits. That they're all all Brassavolas look similar. I think the foliage is actually very elegant. This species has beautifully night scented flowers and they're more of a sort of rich sort of fragrance. I'm not very good at grabbing fragrances. Um, all I can say is it's really good. And because it flowers for me every year at this time of the year, it's one of my most reliable suppliers of scent at this time of the year. Coming back to how to grow it, this is growing in a sort of net pot and inside are fairly chunky pieces of charcoal and bark. For me, they grow very well, this method, but the problem is that the shoots, as they the new shoots grow upwards and then try to arch over, but because they're vertical, when they try to arch over, they do tend to kink, which alarmed me at first. But as you can see from this one, which is one of the flowering spikes, it doesn't seem to affect their performance. So coming back to how to grow them, in future I'm going to mount my brassavolas on bark so that when the new growths come they're already sort of as if pointing out from the branch of a tree and then they can hang down more naturally. So that's the method that I'm going to grow in future, although they grow perfectly well this method. One of the reasons that I wanted to um, film the video at this particular time is to show you this little treasure. This is Angraecum pseudophilicornu. I bought it three years ago as a very small seedling in a little tiny pot and planted it in this um, little tiny sort of basket that I made of western red cedar. Inside there are some chunky bits of bark and it looks like the remains of a little bit of sphagnum moss from the early days. And then, I don't know if you can see, I to sort of stabilise the bits of bark and the plant in it, I bound round some elasticated cotton to keep everything sort of firm while it, while it was establishing. It has really, really delicate little roots. Um, and this year, there was a little sort of shoot that started growing and I wasn't sure at the beginning if it was a side branch but after a while I realised it was actually some flowers developing. So I've ended up with these two beautiful um, flowers with these incredibly long tubes containing the nectar at the bottom. If you look on the internet all the photographs of it look basically just like this. Some are grown in pots, some are grown mounted which I think in hindsight might be a good way of growing it, probably better than in a basket. But I, I think, because it, it hangs up nice and easily, it can get plenty of airflow around it. This one comes from, and I'll just have to look at my notes. This one comes from northern Madagascar in humid, sort of mossy forests, 
between about 1,000 and 1,800 metres. So it could be classified as cool grain. Interestingly, on the internet it also says it's medium sized, but when I got it, it was about this big and it's grown about that much in about three years. So it would take a long time to get much bigger. Unlike most Angracums, unfortunately, this doesn't have a scent. I've sniffed it at all times of the day and night and evening, but I have not been able to detect any scent. Although on the internet it says they are scented. The other thing is, apart from being incredibly large flowers for the size of plant, the um, flowers also last a long time. The first flower opened about 10 days or two weeks ago, and the second one, and that's why I was waiting to film it now, the second one opened, opened a couple of days ago. So it would be interesting to see how long they last. It's a really wonderful little orchid. I'm really thrilled with it. It's always exciting when something you've had for several years and started off as a baby uh, has grown uh, well and then comes to flowering. Really satisfying. Cheers me up. <laughs> anyway, I'll just put this back. This is my Neophoenicia falcata. We're now supposed to call them Vanda falcata. This is another of my reliable, sweet-smelling, beautifully scented orchids that flower at this time of the year. And because I'm really fascinated by orchids that have a beautiful scent, I've gradually sort of built up a collection of scented orchids that through the year um, mean that I can come in and sniff some wonderful scents. And I, I did a previous video on this, um, but I'll just quickly cover it again. This is actually growing on a chunk of bit of sort of tropical wood that it came um, on when it was imported into this country and I kept it on that um, and it has done really well. It grows more slowly I think than if it was given a traditional um, ball of sphagnum moss to grow in but it grows beautifully. I think it presents itself in a wonderful sort of natural way and providing I can spray it every morning and keep it um, well supplied with um, moisture during the growing season, it grows well but slowly. You can see that it's just actually recently the roots have started to grow again and then after flowering it'll have a sort of flush of growth. And because I've been so delighted with um, Neophoenicias, I've just recently acquired a new one. This is called um, now, I don't know how to say this, so I'll just put it up on the screen. This is one of the beautiful sort of pinky-flowered Neophoenicias, which also has given a reasonable amount of light. The foliage is sort of bronzy looking. And the beautiful root tips are pink as well. Now, um, don't criticise me, but this came potted in the traditional way, the traditional Japanese way, with a ball of beautiful sphagnum moss and a sort of hole up the bottom in a sort of open sort of pot. But because I found that in here, for me, the growing on a piece of bark or wood works so well, I decided, in my case, to take it out of the pot and put it on a piece of cork bark. I've kept a reasonable amount of the moss just to sort of tide it over for the meantime. But I've had this just for a few weeks and you can see that the new roots are already beginning to grow again perf perfectly well. There are a couple of little flower buds um, which I don't know if they will um, survive the, the move but um, it would be nice if they do. So I'm hoping that in future I'll have um, two different Neophoenicias to look forward to sniffing every summer. Now I'll just finish up with um, this miniature orchid. This is Lepanthes calidictilon, the famous um, Lepanthes that has these beautifully marbled leaves. Now I mentioned this in a previous video because for quite a few years I had one that did reasonably well and then eventually failed. 
But they are such beautiful little orchids because of the incredibly beautiful foliage. I thought I'd have another go. And growing orchids isn't very easy. It takes quite a long time to develop your skills and knowledge of how things grow in your particular environment. I think now that I will have sufficient experience, hopefully, to keep this growing. Anyway, I'll let you know in the future. This, since I've had it, um, which was, when did I buy it? Uh, a couple of months ago. This has already started growing really well. Um, it's on a piece of cork bark, um, strapped on with some fine, sort of stretchy elastic. And I just put a few strands of sphagnum moss around the sort of root ball of the little pot that it came in. I removed as much of the original moss as possible and then applied a little bit of live moss around it. I find it's useful having some live moss because you can tell by just by looking at it instantly whether it's, you're keeping it sufficiently moist or not. But, of course, you mustn't let the moss develop so um, proliferate so much that it actually overtakes the, the plant itself. So after a while I'll probably have to go in and weed out some of the moss where it starts to encroach on the plants. Interestingly, I've just recently started watching some marvellous uh, videos from South America, uh, Brazil, uh, I think Colombia, YouTubers who have their own channels. And I don't know if you all know this, but if you click on the subtitles of a video, say, in spoken Portuguese or Spanish, depending upon where it's been filmed, and then go to select the auto-translate function and scroll down, and in my case, select English, you actually get a real-time translation of the subtitles. They're not always brilliant, but by watching the video and seeing the plants being handled and looking at the subtitles, you can actually get a tremendous amount of information from them. And I found it particularly helpful watching videos on some of the miniature orchids growing from growers who specialise in them from the actual countries where they grow naturally and grow really well. I mean, it puts most of my miniature orchids to shame. But there we are. Um, we all struggle on and um, so far I'm getting quite good results with this. Right, well that's about it for this episode. Um, lovely to see all my subscribers. Thank you so much for tuning in every time I release a video. I'm sorry they're not more frequent. Um, and hope to see you in the next one. So cheerio for now.